Can we start now? Thank you. So, thank you very much. Um, uh, a warm welcome to the next uh, breakout session. So, we are talking about transaction and trust. And I know we are the last stop before having lunch. And um, thank you very much for having also a very interesting fe my fellows on the panelists. My name is Stephanie Kemp. Uh, I'm a non-exec on the advisory board for the Eco Association, the Internet Economy in Germany. And I have the pleasure to moderate a very interesting session. And we would like to have it a bit more on the fly, a change, because uh, one of my colleagues here on stage, Mr. Engels from BASF, is not joining us. And that's the reason why we do not have really someone gives us an input. I would like to do a brief framing on our session. So we are talking about uh, that uh, uh, cyber crime and cyber breaches are increasingly increasing. And our problem here today is, do we really find uh, rules or do we would like to have policies, standard policies, in place and what does it mean from the various angles. So I'm very pleased that I have um, Elius Civils here today, our uh, Deputy Minister Digitization from Lithuania. Then, thank you. Um, unexpected, Mark is again here. Uh, Mark is representing the insurance company Ergo, yeah, is my understanding. The next one is Maximilian Teintal. Uh, Maximilian, thank you. Then I have Gertrud Livien on stage. Gertrud will give us a bit more an overview of best practices here today. Then I have Thomas Rosenbeck on stage. And I have uh, Christian Mir here. And finally, uh, today uh, on the fly, I had the change of Mr. Shen Yi from China. So uh, up from the panel, we decided that everyone will have a very short introduction of himself or herself. And just give me um, a small uh, frame of what is your touch point to this topic. And I would like to start here on my left side, Mr. Shen Yi, if you would like to start with it. Uh, surprising and uh, come here. I think it's, the, my, it's my first time to be the IGF. And I'm coming from the universities, uh, serve as kind of uh, research on these cybersecurity things. My background is information and uh, international relations. So I'd like to talk about these things in the background or the framework of intentional theories. In the series of these intentional relations, we talk about norms, mechanisms a lot. This kind of norms and mechanisms, the main functions is to regulate the different actors' behaviors to make their behaviors more predictable, more stable, and finally lead to a kind of consistent, stable cooperations among different actors. And the second, I think such kind of norms, of course, is very important to the cyberspace, especially in today's world. In today's world, just like Professor Joseph Nye mentioned, that these ICT revolutions happen in an environment which we don't have enough trust among the main actors, which means the state actors. While simultaneously, it's very interesting to find out the development of ICT and the cyberspace depend heavily on whether these actors can have enough trust and cooperation with each other. So it's kind of very interesting paradox games. On one side, these, these actors, they compete. The computer will have more influence to enjoy more advantages. On the other side, all these actors, their behaviors must be limited into some certain margins, which means that during these competitions, you should not completely destroy all these cyberspace. Yes, if you unilaterally enjoy these advantages too much, you destroy the basic trust, no global cyberspace, and no these games, and then with no internet. So it's very interesting games. And during the third, during these procedures, norms are very important. Such kind of norms, I think there are three very important characteristics. First, equities. Second, systematic. Thirdly, balanced. It should be very important to notice Last, not least, these kind of norms should only serve this minority or unilateral actors' uh, profits. It must meet the uh, benefits for the actors as much as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Christian, um, from the Reporters Without Borders, may I can just ask a question on what are the relevant cyber breaches you see here today? What? what are the relevant cyber breaches you see oh. today? 
I mean, relevant cyber breaches, I see, first of all, quite overarching thing that we, from Reporters at Borders, we are a human rights organization defending the human right to press freedom and freedom of information, but the whole environment has been changing in last year, and we have a discussion on trust and distrust into media, and so this is actually the, the fundamental layer for, for, for press freedom, and so for us, this is really a breach, I would say, is that we have all over the world discussions on trust into media and the, the aim um, which we as Reporters Without Borders currently are facing is that we, we are thinking about how to create trust signals in the information and communication global space and that's why we developed, we initiated actually a, a bit of IGF style multi-stakeholderism approach, a so-called journalism trust initiative, which is actually a European standard, um, which in the idea is, um, which this in the end should be a trusted third party me mechanism to, to, to incentivize media outlets that respective journalistic methods and ethics can be prioritized by, by um, in algorithmic indexation. And that's why we, in the last year, we had a procedure, a discussion with several stakeholders. Um, and it's important that Facebook, Google, they participated in the project and they even registered for it. A, a multi-stakeholder um, approach with media, with, with associations, and uh, moreover, as I said, Facebook, Google, which is important. And we aim that actually this um, prioritization in the algorithmus indexation in the end will lead to some more trust if people can identify better some ethics and principles but what is important um, we don't have the aim to judge any content um, it's just about ethics and principles because we as a human rights organization we are not defending any content and so the question of Trust is for us really a major uh, 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 distrust. Actually, the growing distrust is a major breach. Thank you very much. So I would like to um, go to um, uh, Mr. Uh, to Ilios. Ilios, um, when we had a f very easy chat before having this panel here today, and I really like your question, um, you would like to raise me. Do you feel secure in the internet? Well. Um I think this is a relevant question for all of us. Um, me personally, I feel secure, but uh, if I think of uh, my main stakeholders, like my grandmother or my mother or my kids, I don't think they feel uh, very much secure. And this is because of this mystification about this cyber security, cyber crime, and everyone talking, you know, about the digital skills. So <clears throat> the problem is that um, <clears throat> on one hand, we are like in the government we are focused very much on the digital enabled services. So in Lithuania, we have 86% uh, of all the citizens and 90 something percent of all the enterprises that engage the government through the digital channels only. So in other words, everyone is uh, talking to us digitally, but then not everyone is having enough understanding what's happening in the digital space. So in the government, in the past, we were so much focused on the digital skills. So what it means, it means like basically training my grandma to, to do programming. But it's not about programming, right? It's about how do we understand their identities in the digital space, how we understand the ethics, how we understand, you know, the rights on the digital space. So I think the digital intelligence is what we are really aiming at. And if we increase that with the society, then I think we mitigate a lot of, lot of those crimes as well. Thank you. So Maximilian. Just to my right, um, the founder of this C uh, and CFO of N26 GmbH, what are you exactly doing? Um, N26 is a fintech startup based in Berlin. We founded the company in 2013. Um, today, I think we employ about 1,500 people. The idea behind N26 has always been to build a pan-European bank, the vision behind N26. So we're the only ones today that based on one IT platform and one banking license onboard customers all over Europe. Like that vision has become bigger lately. Today we want to build the first global 
retail bank we just launched in the US um, from New York with other markets to follow. So what's the product of N26? We are providing a digital first uh, bank account. So we are providing a product for millennials that like to do things on the smartphone after we actually realized that while well, there's a massive shift in user behavior, like from offline to online to mobile. So in our world, people used to go to the bank branch, then they did banking um, on the browser, now they do banking on the smartphone, and we realized that no bank pretty much throughout the world is really providing a great product, a great digital use experience for um, people that like to do things online and on their smartphones. And that's kind of the niche we're tapping into. I think we have four and a half million customers today, and we're the fastest growing bank in Europe. And my understanding here is if you are working as an online banking, um, does it mean are there specific challenges um, how to, I would like to say, um, prevent cyber <laughs> or um, internet breaches from your point of view to, I would like to say, establish and provide a secure business? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like we obviously like in a business and there we are not different to, to other banks where we're dealing with the most private data of the customer and we're dealing um, with the customer's money. So... Um, security, keeping this data private and keeping the money safe is um, an intrinsic part of the business. Like if you lose data, if you lose money, you can just go home and do something else. I think also in terms, and there was a lot of thought about that, like at N26, um, we're not really advertising with security because uh, I think one, it's not a, a place where you can really differentiate yourself from other banks. I think traditionally, like, like also banks, there's no way to claim that um, the money at a traditional bank is less safe than at N26. But obviously, like for customer, trust is a very important part of the metric. And how do you generate trust? Um, it is this obvious, obviously around the service. It is about predictability, but it's also about safety and security. So what we're doing at N26... Um, we are basically maintaining the standards of modern technology companies. So we are having a big internal security team. Uh, we have a bug bounty program where hackers are being incentivized to find flaws in our, in our code. Basically, they try to attack our systems, like the friendly kind of hackers. And if they find something like Google and, and all the other, like Facebook, all the other companies are having the same concept. You get a bigger premium if you find something at Google than at N26, but um, you get a premium. We do penetration testing, so we engage into external hackers to try to hack our systems. And first, they start with zero information, um, trying to, to hack in from the outside, trying to park uh, on the parking lot, trying to log into our... Um, network that it would walk in, try to find a laptop, and then you give them more and more information. Like finally, that they are on the level of information, um, like some some frustrated former employee. Uh, so that's just part of our of our like uh, security systems we have in place. I think most important to know in our world, the weakest spot is always um, the customer. So um, there's a lot of social engineering going on, and uh, I think companies like N26 that have an easy account opening process are even more likely to get targeted. But there's a lot of education uh, to the customer how you can actually prevent of being like, um, uh, like used as a tool to, to open accounts, for example, that are later used for fraud or for terrorism um, financing. So preventing fraud and financial crime um, is, is, is a very like, important or has to be a very important point for us. While we fully understand it's not a big factor of, the, of differentiation. So I, th I don't think you can actually win the game by being the most secure, but you can definitely lose the game by making any major mistake in that regard. Thank you very much. Um, Thomas, being um, the digital uh, president of the business unit of the digital security solutions at Enfinion, the weakest point is the customer. How do you feel about that? And what does it mean for you also acting as an international organization? Yeah, right. Perhaps the, the first question, what does a semiconductor manufacturer, so being somewhere deep in the, in the products, what, what do we do here, right, on this forum? I think it's a, um, beside, besides mobility and energy efficiency, security is the main theme of, of Infineon and trying to make the world 
uh, safer in this regard. So if you talk about the customer, coming back to this uh, question and also what, what you said um, about your grandma, it's a question, we, I think we are expecting way too much from the consumer. We are not expecting, for example, that you have to be an engineer to drive a car, right? Because we assume that a car is secure. So we have to trust in, in that. Right? If it comes to trust in the, in the field of, of uh, internet security, it's about two questions. The first question is, do you want to protect me? And are you able to protect me? So assuming N26 wants to protect me, right, then that's about the capabilities. Are you able to protect me? And this is where we can, can then play a role and try to get, um, get things in. And there are some fundamental standards like security by design and also what, uh, what Mr. Kesa this morning said in, um, it's about the trusted value chain. Do I know what kind of products I use and where they're coming from? So you see it get, it's got a bit of a different, different angle to, to other, um, other statements here. Um, but it's about, it's about what is the foundation of, um, of, of what we do. So today we already do that. So we trust devices, you trust devices. So for example, every second credit card you have in your pocket has a chip from us. So you trust us already. If you are traveling with, with, a, with a passport, you are trusting us already. And it's about, it's about this, this root of trust and this anchor of trust, I think, that we have, have to work on. And uh, I think it was already touched today, which I deem very important, is the question of, um, of standardization. Right? We, need, we need standards for security also around the world, and we need one standard preferably, not 25, because then, then, it's, then it's not going to going to work. And I think from that perspective, this, these are things that we are driving uh, heavily on. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's what, what our role is in this game. Thank you. So I'm a bit confused because the door is open and it's a bit crowding. Can you please close the door so far as long we have the panel? No, 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 we have, uh, sorry, we have a delay in here. Yeah, just started. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Andre. No, sir. Come on. Andre, one more question. Um, being the chair of the Joint European Disruptive Initiative, what does it mean? Disruptive is a strong word in there, right? Okay, I think we're going to try to hack the session still. I mean, a little comment with a lot of appreciation for all the people working hard for the session. We hear, it's a bit of political comment, so many calls about multilateralism. If the multilateral organizations are not able to organize events that work well and are efficient, we are cooked. I mean, Bully. this is a very, and I hope the journalists Thank you for or the, the media, I mean, it's a disgrace, I'm sorry. Huh? Bon. So, uh, a quick, a quick response on that. Uh, ju just uh, the, the initiative I'm heading is the European equivalent to DARPA. So basically trying to invent the next big thing and not just trying to, to run after the others. A, a few points. One, um, which is important, is, is um, the, the topic of trust or ethics that we sometimes separate from, from technology. I mean, I could go much deeper into it, but basically today the technologies convey values. So you cannot develop... Uh, technologies without taking some stance. Think about face recognition, think about you know, open ar architecture or closed architecture, cl uh, think about fragmentation of the, of the internet. So uh, this is something very important because you cannot just say that, okay, we develop the technology and we let others do the, the, the ethics committee and so on. The second thing which is really my biggest concern, and maybe since we have some limited time, let's focus on the, on the key. We are entering the world of autonomous systems. We're entering the world where basically the complexity of our world has become m larger than we can just understand. The number of data, the number of emails, the number of WhatsApps. So if we don't have these autonomous systems, and especially in the response or um, in, the, in the preventive postures we can have to cyber attacks, we will increasingly run after the threats. And I must say, and this has a third consequence, 
I'm not so sure that we will be able to establish one standard or one committee because you will increasingly have, we need to think much more like the tech world is thinking in ecosystems. That means we need to have an ability to have regulations which pop up that are adapted to a special threat. If they are very adapted to a specific situation, then they are taken over by, but this myth which is still very European, huh? to think, okay, we can have one single standard. Uh, I always give this example of GDPR, and I'm sorry because people who listened to me yesterday, uh, they, they heard that again, but it took us five years to do GDPR. Five years ago, it was great. Today, you realize that actually it acts like a barrier of entry for those who have already massive data, and it acts like a incredible um, complexity for the smaller firms who want, to, who want to enter the data business. So actually, GDPR today promotes monopolies in the data business and not the opposite. So this is also a call for, for, for policymakers, is can we go to governance systems which are much more on experimentation, try out the regulation, and, and not just sandboxes, because sandboxes are often a, a, an excuse for not actually scaling it, but really giving it an opportunity to go much faster and act in months and weeks. Otherwise, the risk is those who will be in advance on technology threats and, and look at, I mean, the Bundestag was just hacked a year, uh, a month, a year ago by, uh, by a young 20-year-old out of Frankfurt with, who used, a, a, um, who used a, a, an issue with Vista. Very simple, took, I think, uh, BSI uh, one or two months to, to identify the cause of this hacking. Imagine those hacks that will be much more driven on autonomous systems with some kind of AI embedded. If we are not able to react much faster, and, and then increasingly we will we will we have, will have this feeling that we lose it. And your grandmother, instead of feeling more and more secure, she actually will have the feeling that the, the, she will have increasingly less impact on the world around her. And that makes me worry, not just about this little elite group that convenes here, but about much larger population that feel that technology is a threat to them. And that's my biggest worry. Thank you. Um, before um, going to Gertrude, she will give us um, a very short overview of best practices. I would like to ask Mark tough words. We are not able to implement any kind of norms, I would like to say internationally or European-wide, as Andre mentioned. What do you think about from the ergo perspective as a CDO? Yeah, very good question. First of all, let me just say one thing about the cyber risks that we see in the market. For us, they are really... Uh, exponentially growing and they come with two flavors and that is important to understand. The first thing is on the B2B side, so companies, we see more and more devices being connected and at the moment you have the smartphone, you have the laptop, you have your company network but we heard from Bosch that you will have all the IoT devices, they will all be a, a, a potential to basically enter your company and uh, start the cyber crime. Nevertheless, we don't insure much there in the B2B space in Germany, close to zero. It's 90% in the US market because the government is basically saying you have to. So you see that the awareness, even, even with the companies, is not there. The second flavor is the B2C market. And here um, I see, and we had it on the last panel, I see especially the young ones being heavily at risk. There it's also a bit pishing and uh, a bit uh, um, social engineering, but also the whole thing about cyber mobbing. I think every second kid in Germany has basically experience with cyber mobbing. The speech gets harder and basically we are not supporting our kids to, to basically cope with that. Yeah, when I have a daughter that is 13, she's going to school, the plan is the same than I had. No media competence, nothing. And I think we have a lot to do. But even here, do we have a standard for that in Germany? No. Do we have a standard in Europe? It's very, it's very difficult. We are not pushing for that, even though we know. Even though we are talking on the panels that the cyber risk is exploding, we don't have the awareness by companies. And I'm not talking, I think that Bosch and Infineon, you know that. You have certain packages, you are insured. But the SMB market is basically uninsured. And they don't have the awareness. When it happens, it is too late, and then they lose a lot. 
But currently, I think what we have to do, and here I would also see support from uh, governmental initiatives and being it for the, for the school system in Germany to create more awareness on this kind of topics. Because they are there and we are just at the beginning. Believe me, the number of connected devices will explode and with this, the cyber risk will explode. Whether we want it or not, the attacker has a clear advantage and the defender has a disadvantage because there are more points to enter. Thank you, Mark. Gertrude. As the Digital Health Manager for the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy, um, you offered to give us a short overview of a best practice example, and a key question for me is who will benefit from that? Well, um, I think that the primary beneficiary of verified top-level domains will be the billions of internet users who can find safe online spaces by, by using verified top-level domains and the websites within them. Um, but first I need to back up a little bit and talk about what a, what a verified top-level domain is. Um, so I'm here to talk about verified top-level domains and the role they play in, in promoting online safety and trust. So the current online environment is one where um, the end users really have to beware of fraudulent and deceptive websites. Um, and they're prevalent. So for instance, 95% of websites selling prescription drugs online are doing so illegally. Um, phishing incidents were up 68% or 41%, I'm sorry, in, uh, in 2018. And banking scams compose about a third of all phishing scams globally. Um, so verified TLDs are one answer to um, fraud and deception online. And the Verified TLD Consortium was established in 2016 to create safe online spaces for end users and to give commercial registrants a way to stand out as legitimate and, and trustworthy. Um, the consortium is an informal voluntary association of registry operators for generic top-level domains and the third parties that administer or support them. Its mission is to enhance public trust and online safety and e-commerce by promoting the value of TLDs and raising <coughs> awareness about TLDs as trusted channels for products, services, and communications online, and that's specifically verified TLDs. Um, members of the consortium require certain safeguards, um, and those include pre-verification of registrants before they're able to use a domain name, um, for instance, uh, registry operators will verify um, who, verify that the registrant is who they say they are and that they have the proper credentials to register a domain within that TLD. Um, members of the consortium also require that registrants within the TLD adhere to standards. Um, as defined in the registration policies. For instance, that might include appropriate credentials and so forth. Um, verified top-level domains also engage in online monitoring to ensure continued compliance with registration policies and continued eligibility. And should, the, should, it, should it be the case that a domain ceases to be in compliance with these standards. Verified TLDs maintain the um, autonomy to take back the name. Um, do I have time to present a couple of use cases? Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Um, well, dot pharmacy is one such use case. It is um, operated by the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy and um, it requires an application to uh, first establish eligibility to register a domain within that top level domain. Um, it requires compliance with 
juris with uh, pharmacy laws in the jurisdiction where it's based, as well as where its customers live. Um, in the process um, of, uh, of this verification, it creates a safe online space for consumers to rest assured that the medications or information or services that they're obtaining online are authentic and safe. Another use case is FTLD, which is the registry operator for dot bank and dot insurance. Um, these are also verified TLDs, and um, they require that um, that registrants be pre-verified to ensure that they are um, registered or chartered with the appropriate governmental regulatory authority. Um, so in that case, they are providing an online space for um, companies and their customers uh, where that are that's more secure and reliable. Um, so operating a, TL, a verified TLD does not come without a cost. Um, verification is very resource intensive um, because verified TLDs tend to serve niche markets. Verification registration volume tends to be a tends to be lower than it would be in, in uh, registries that are completely open to anyone. Um, and not all registrars work with verified top-level domains, but the members of the Verified Top-Level Domains Consortium um, feel that those costs are outweighed by the benefits. And, um, those benefits include, um, well, the fact that costs can be offset by higher fees. Um, verified TLDs are gaining recognition within their respective communities. And abuse is practically unheard of in a verified TLD. And perhaps most importantly, um, they promote safety, reliability, and trust online. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gertrude. <clears throat> so, we heard um, some emotional statements here. Time is now. We, need, we are in a rush. Do we really get control of all these things? And I would like to, due to our timing and our lunch, which is waiting for us outside, a final question. Very easy, very short. Listen, we are, we are all waiting outside. You can't Do you strongly believe... Can you please not so unpolite because we are in the middle of our session? No, we are losing our audience. This is not fair to our session. We yeah, started yeah. to bring people from all over the world. Okay. It's really unbelievable. It's really un inconsiderable. Yeah, I, 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 I. So final question is, um, if, you would like to, if you would like to say, are we really able to implement standard norms international-wise and... Do you, and what would be the time frame? You, what is your best guess behind? Um, the, sim the simplest answer is yes, and the time frame is not that hard to determine, but in the coming three or five years, we have to set up such kind of norms. Otherwise, the development technologies will push forward. Thank you. Yes, I strongly believe so. I'm working for a human rights organization and believing in human rights, and I think a um, long time ago we agreed on something like the International Declaration on Human Rights, and given actually the, the, the media change, the change with, with the digitalization all over the world, currently it's our task to transform this human rights into the standard um, of human rights um, into the digital world, but we try to do so, and I think there are best practices, and, they, and the Internet Governance Forum is still, and I'm string, you can criticize IGF um, uh, strongly, but I still believe that the IGF is a unique opportunity, unique platform do to agree on standards which in the end will lead to concrete policy making but a final word a final word there's always the risk that standards are misunderstood as over regulation in terms of turning authoritarian controlling but I think sometimes um, trust and I think standards lead to accountability and I think that's what what um, what's about
Thank you. I, I, it's an interesting one, like, but I will try to cut myself very short. But I think there was a problem with the organization. Actually, we just uh, started our panel like with one hour delay, and I think this is like um, like caused by the people organizing that, right? We can discuss that later on if we can finish it now. Okay. We can discuss it. Okay. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think there will be there will be global standard. I think how we see like from a user experience perspective, I think the smartphone, I think the iPhone has established a global standard for user experience. So if you think about like great digital products, I think a great digital product looks the same in Europe, in Asia, and in South America. And I think there is also regardless of whether this is being passed by some government body, I think there's also a global standard for security. There's best practices, like some of the standards I mentioned, as I said before, they were also like, it's the same standard that Google is using, that Facebook is using, and all the great digital companies we're looking for for inspiration. Yeah, I think I would agree. We need to have a standard. Standard is important, and I think we have to go even a bit further because as sec security is not yet uh, in every device. We have to also think about where we need regulation to really enforce um, that security is used wherever necessary. This is very kind of you, Gertrude. So one word on standards. I think, yes, we need we need actually strategy, and I give an example. There was in the briefing the topic on deep fakes. Right now, the only ones, and to build on what uh, uh, you just said on, on, uh, from, from N26, uh, when today Facebook uh, is regulating content, probably the 10 or 20 curators or the top line guys at Facebook have more regulatory power than the 750 members of European Parliament. When I see that, deep, that the only ones who are working on deepfakes right now is Facebook again, who is launching a challenge, I as a citizen in a democratic country does not want to delegate this regulatory power. So it's absolutely critical that we get our acts together from a civil society point of view. It's not to be anti-Facebook, but if we are not as quick and as snappy as them, de facto they will set standards. I very much hope it's possible. I'm a bit skeptical because I see currently the trends going into a different direction. Anyways, I expect for the bright future very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay. So hello, welcome everybody to this uh, to this symposium. We finally made it. We conquered our room, and we're going to start right away and be fast, swift, and efficient. So, <laughs> in the in, in order to do this, rather than giving myself to you a long introduction, I just want to do that <laughs> and give the word to these three gentlemen who are the best people to introduce you to exactly what we want to do here and, uh, and why it is our efforts are important. So uh, the first person I'm going to give the floor to is Ricardo Corredor, who is the president of the Global Forum for Media Development. Ricardo. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess we have to be brief. Um, so I'll be brief. Um, welcome. Uh, for us, this is a very important uh, moment uh, because we have been, we, as GFMD, we engaged in this space since 2017 with many of our members, some of whom are here present. Um, I just, it might be obvious, but it, nevertheless, it is important to, to state that this relationship between journalism and digital technology is very much at the core of things happening today. Uh, and this is why we believe it is important to be here and to engage with this agenda. It is a very complex agenda. And what we've seen is that in general terms, journalism and journalism associations and media associations are absent. So that's why we thought this space was important. And this is why we're here, and this is why we have to take this opportunity to discuss what are the main issues and the priorities. So welcome. Let's try to make the best of it in this half an hour that they stole from us. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll continue. And now we, we, will see, we will hear from uh, Mark Nelson, who is the Senior Director of the Center for International Media Assistance at the National Endowment for Democracy. Yeah, I just want to say that I'm really delighted we're finally in the room and that uh, this is the beginning of a really important conversation and we're really glad all, all of you are here because I think we can take this opportunity for, of us coming together to really develop a voice in this space because that's what this is about. It's about having the people in the news media, especially news media from small uh, parts of the world, small news media that are working all, all across the world, having a voice in this global agenda. And it's really important for us to come together and to think about what it is we are trying to achieve and to develop a work plan that, is, uh, that serves our interests as, um, um, as news and information uh, providers across the world. And we really want to have that kind of voice in the proceedings in, in, for the future of a working global internet. Gregor Barrier, who is part of the policy and concept department at Deutsche Welle Academy. Hello, a warm welcome also for, um, on behalf of DW Academy. We are very happy to be here. It's an importing, important starting point, but it's already for us uh, an, uh, a story of success, a story of success in terms of raising the voice of the media development community, and also um, on, on this forum, which is rather complex, and also a story of good cooperation with the Global Media Forum for the development and for SEMA. So um, basically to make <laughs> um yeah, I, I think this is the moment to prepare us to to, to discuss, to prepare us for that, what's coming now. And from our part, our role we see, our role is to contribute from our experiences in the 50 countries where we are working, on the practical experiences, and helping different voices, especially from the global uh, south, to um, discuss, to participate here on this forum. Thank you very much. So we can now uh, go directly to our keynote speaker. Um, uh, it is, I, I just, I met him today for the first time, but I have read him so much. So it, it felt like I already, I already knew him. It was, it was a very, it was a moment when I finally got to meet him. Rasmus Nielsen. So Rasmus is uh, the director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. He is a professor of political communication at the University of Oxford and was previously director of research and the, at the, of the Reuters Institute and editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Press Politics. Um, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, first of all, to the organizers pulling together this really important conversation. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of backstage work that goes into that. And I think we should all be very grateful for all the hard work uh, that makes it possible for us to meet today in this room to talk about the role uh, of independent professional journalism forward uh, and what can be done to uh, create a more enabling environment uh, for that. In the interest of trying to make a, a small contribution to this uh, important discussion that all of us uh, are interested in, I've worked with a couple of co-authors to try to pull together a, a set of options of what policymakers could conceivably do should they sincerely be interested in creating a, a better environment for independent professional journalism going forward. If I can ask for the slides to be pulled up, please. Thank you. So this report has just been published today, um, and I'm not gonna try to go into all the details. You can find the full report uh, on our website. But I wanna just draw a quick, uh, a quick picture of what the challenges are that we think needs addressing and what some of the options where we believe there are good practices available if, if policymakers are sincerely interested in trying to make a difference in this area. I think the challenge essentially is, uh, is twofold. Uh, one is uh, a question um, this is going to be a teamwork. Um, thank you in advance for um, letting yourself be volunteered to help advance my slides. If I can just say next and then we move, is that okay? Thank you. So on the one hand, I think we have a clear challenge which some has described and I think rightly as something that falls only barely short of a war on journalism uh, being perpetrated by powerful people across the world. Um, and this I think many of you know from personal experience and are fighting against. Of course, there is another side of the challenges facing independent professional journalism today which has to do with funding uh, of the profession as we know it. If we could please advance to the next slide. Uh, ah, okay. So. Look at this, fantastic. Um, where on the one hand we have the very long term and inexorable one way decline of the legacy business models, which in some countries by now has been in decline for more than half a century, in print for example in the United States. But also of course in a digital environment where the advertising money and consumer spend is increasingly moving, the emergence of relatively new and dominant uh, 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 actors that capture a very large share of the advertising market. So I think these are the challenges we face, questions of freedom, questions of funding, and what that means for the future of independent journalism really I think is the question. Now, I worked with this team of co-authors to try to review some of the options that might be available uh, to, to intervene in this space. And I think the three things we're looking for essentially are these, right? Freedom, funding, and a future for independent professional journalism. And the question is, what can policymakers do? The first thing to say is, um, there is no silver bullet, right? Uh, we haven't found one. We don't believe there is one. We face a complex a combination of different problems and not going to be one intervention that will address all of them in one go. The second thing to say is uh, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. Different markets are different. Uh, journalism in different countries face different problems, and we don't presume to offer sort of a single recipe that will work uh, everywhere. Even just within Europe, which is sort of the, the primary scope of the report itself, I think it's important to recognize the variation, for example, in levels of press freedom and levels of perceived public corruption. Uh, and think about whether uh, it forms a policy that might be appropriate in a country like Germany with high levels of press freedom and low levels of perceived corruption would also be appropriate in countries that may have low levels of press freedom and high levels of perceived corruption where citizens might understandably question whether it's a good idea to spend their money propping up media that may in fact be very mere mouthpieces uh, of the government uh, or their oligarchic allies. Um, so with that in mind, uh, what we did is to try to sort of look at things that might actually work. Okay, I think there are two things to say here as we go into looking at some of the options. The first is there are options, right? We need to break with the sort of the slight um, risk towards sort of learned helplessness, where I think sometimes some policymakers uh, come sort of perilously close to appearing as if they want to pretend that there is nothing they could possibly do. This is not true. There are options. 
there are demonstrable examples of good practices. Secondly, we need to recognize that these things are not free, right? Um, and, and there is a question of money too, but I think here we need to just sort of think about what the backdrop is here, which is within Europe alone, just again to use that example, the annual budget of the European Commission is more than 100, sorry, the European Union is more than 160 billion euros a year, and the combined public expenditure of the, of the EU member states is more than seven trillion dollar, uh, uh, euros, right? So there is money, it's a question of decisions, basically. Okay, the three areas that we looked at, and we'll just highlight a few of the things that strike us as potentially most promising in each of these areas. Um, freedom first, right? These things come in order of priority. Without freedom, funding in the future doesn't really make much of a difference from the point of view of what it is we're trying to uh, ensure that journalism can do for societies. The first thing to say on freedom is that there is a clear implementation gap between the things that policymakers have committed to in writing and what they're actually doing in practice in many countries around the world. This, of course, needs to be addressed. Uh, within the European Union, there is an opportunity to put some pressure behind that uh, a desire to close the implementation gap if the proposed rule of law review was tied to access to European Union funds. So that we actually actual consequences if member states did not in fact live up to the commitments they have made in the treaty and in wider international human rights law. And the third observation we would make in this space is to say when we think about more contemporary and future challenges around things like disinformation, I think it's really important we stress that any intervention in those spaces needs to be within the framework of international human rights law. And the current tendency of sort of somebody must do something about bad people doing bad things online is not really a functioning framework and one that can lead to quite a lot of dangers for abuse and, and, and I think already some examples of this happening around the world. The second area is funding, right? Uh, we want journalism not only to be independent, but also be professional. Uh, professional work is not, vocational, is not avocational work. People want to be paid, uh, and we need uh, institutions that are financially sustainable. What might be done in that area? Uh, we already, of course, support uh, uh, the news organizations that invest uh, in, in, in journalism through various forms of VAT exemptions and the like. And I think the first thing to be done is to ensure that these forms of support reflect the digital media reality we are in. So in many countries, VAT exemptions exist only for printed newspapers, for example, not for digital subscriptions. This is rewarding the past at the expense of the future. There are also countries like Denmark, where I'm from originally, that demonstrate that one can, in fact, provide direct support, as said, in free societies with low levels of public corruption, direct support for independent private sector news media to invest in, public, uh, in, in, in professional journalism. Secondly, of course, we have public service media in Europe, a proud tradition, imperfect, with some limitations in some member states. But again, I think we need to recognize if policymakers are serious about this area, genuinely independent public service media can make a difference. This is a model that exists, and it is one that is open to policymakers should they des desire to pursue it. Finally, of course, we have the area of nonprofit journalism of increasing importance around the world, but one that's really constrained by charity laws that often don't recognize journalism as a nonprofit cause, and thus it's very difficult to create nonprofit media and to support nonprofit media. Again, this is a solvable problem. I turn third to the question of the future. Um, where I think the first thing to say is it's, it's good to see that competition authorities around the world are thinking about what their role is going forward and thinking about the importance of ensuring that all actors compete on a level playing field in a digital marketplace for advertising, for consumer spend, and other resources. Secondly, I think it's clear we face a set of challenges that impact journalism too, which is about the opacity of the online environment. And if we want journalism to succeed long term, I think journalism too will benefit if policymakers ensure that we have a more accountable, intelligible, and transparent platform mediated environment where, for example, we have various forms of multi stakeholder oversight, as suggested by Article 19 and others, more investment in media literacy, and access to data for independent research by civil society organizations and academics so we can better understand the media environment that we all rely on. And finally, of course, again, there are models of how uh, governments and other public authorities can invest money in journalistic innovation in ways that do not interfere with editorial independence. These models exist, and if governments are serious about supporting uh, the development of journalism, they should consider whether they in fact want to deploy these tools. So this is where I'll end. Uh, none of this will be easy, none of this will be cheap, but I think we really need to recognize this is possible, and something needs to be done if we want journalism to succeed going forward. And here I think really just we need to again sort of confront the question of whether there is perhaps sometimes a slightly a risk of a degree of something approximating hypocrisy 
among some policymakers who pretend that there are no tools available, nothing they could possibly do, where in fact there are examples of what could be done. And I think we should judge their sincerity to their commitment, uh, of their commitment to independent professional journalism on the basis of whether they actually do something. With that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rasmus. So we, we are going to make a little time for questions, if there are any. Does anybody want to ask a question to Rasmus? Yes. Um, in February, we were in a meeting, some of us were here in a meeting in, in Bellagio. And it was a very interesting meeting uh, because we were trying to think about these issues in a broader sense, not only digital, but in a broader sense. And I came out of that meeting uh, and I said to my colleagues, this is like, uh, I've never been so sad and so happy at the same time. Um, because for me, the conclusion is, as you said, at this moment, really, there is no one that knows what's the future, what's going to happen. Really, at this moment, there's no one that can say, this is where, where we're going to. And at the same time, so this is bad. But at the same time, it was a sort of relief in the sense that we are all very stressed out because we all want to find out what's going to be the key solution. And there isn't. So, but the, the, the issue is, okay, so we have this kind of like battleground and where there is, but instead of two armies, there's like a thousand armies. And there are huge ones, like the big platforms, and there are small organizations and medium-sized organizations. So the thing is, to me, and I don't know how you fit this in what you were thinking, is how, to level the field when there are like so many actors at the same time, what it brings is the discussion of what's, you know, the, the democratic ways of doing this conversation. And this is where I see the most complicated thing because what we've seen in the world is that we're not very sure how democratic we can be in terms of bringing up these discussions. So I was wondering if you can maybe have a thought on this because this has to do a little, a little bit of leveling the market field, but it also has to do with politics and this has to do with many different complex things. And, 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 and I think complex is, is it's, it's a key word in this discussion. Great. I mean, I, I think that's exactly right. And on, on some days, I feel a bit like you describe your experience of, of attending that workshop. Um, uh, I would say that on closer inspection, I think sometimes if we start breaking down the problems we face in many parts of the world, they are significant, but perhaps not quite as overwhelming as we may feel in first sight. And I think it's important to recognize the difference between the very severe and almost insurmountable problems that journalists face in some parts of the world, where I think we can only all collectively sort of admire the tenacity and sort of heroism, really, with which people insist on sort of carrying on in, in ways I think are a reminder that journalism, even without the privileges we've had historically in the Western world, is incredibly important and powerful even without the sort of the large muscular organizations and the trappings and whatnot of, of, that we associate with professional journalism in some part of the world. But also if we turn to the more privileged parts of the world, I think we really, I think, need to recognize that um, things may not always be as overwhelmingly sort of precarious and threatening as we might think. And what I mean by that is essentially is to say, okay, well, if we look at some of the most privileged countries in the world, take Norway, right, okay, Norway has high press freedom. It has a newspaper industry that last year, for the first time in 10 years, noted growing revenues, okay? Top line growth, dr driven by digital subscriptions to local and national newspapers. So, so they look like they may have sort of come through a phase of this and into a new phase. And third, of course, they have this growth despite the fact that they have record levels of internet use, broadband access, mobile use, and of course a very large role played by large international tech companies in that market, right? So I think if we can see the beginnings of some countries where some of these things are falling into place in a new equilibrium or a new sort of plateau that isn't the one we had, but isn't terrible. Actually, it looked kind of good and always kind of a impressive place in many ways. And I'm not saying, of course, it's a model that can just be rolled out. I think that can perhaps help us sort of contain our pessimism and then focus on the question of how do we get to that marginally better place rather than being overwhelmed by the challenges, which are great, but I should also say, I think are no greater than the ones that previous generations of journalists faced elsewhere, right? I mean, this is, we are not the first generation to be tested, right? And some of the threats, I think, frankly, were bigger, totalitarianism, for example, than the ones we face today. We have another question here. 
Yeah, um, thank you. My name is Julius from the DW Academy. This is um, a few on the um, supply side. Do we have, or what are your findings on the demand side and what needs to be done on um, create more demand for, this in, for the industry? Um, so, I think, um, I think there is a real uh, issue there that I would personally say is probably mostly something for journalists and news organizations to think about. Like, wh in, in what way can we ensure that the public recognize as valuable what we do in a way that is so valuable to them that they will spend their precious time and perhaps sometimes their precious money with it? And it seems to me that that answer cannot be to do things tomorrow the way we did them yesterday, because that model, I think, is demonstrably failing. Um, so I think that's a, a discussion that is really urgently important for journalists to have. And just as like a simple indicator of this is just, OK, the vast majority of news online is free at the point of consumption and available to anyone anywhere with an internet connection. And despite that ease of access, um, on average, in most markets that I'm familiar with around the world, people spend about 3% of their time with news online, right? So it's not that they can't access it, and it's not that it's too expensive, it's that they don't find it valuable and appealing to them. But, but I would say that is a discussion I would be extremely reluctant to see policymakers play any uh, role in. I think that is one for the profession and the public. Um, and one where I'd rather see a thousand flowers bloom than any kind of sort of policy intervention. You know, you know perhaps media literacy might help, uh, as long as it's affirmative as, uh, in addition to critical. As Dana Boyd and others have rightly said, I think we've had a tendency in media, in media literacy discussion to focus on teaching people to be skeptical in a world that is uh, arguably uh, pretty skeptical already. And perhaps sometimes if we could help people acquire tools to make affirmative decisions as well about who they might trust more than others, perhaps they will then start actually engaging more with some of those providers. Thank you. We have time only for one last question, I'm afraid. The Could we have a question from a woman, maybe? There's been a lot of men speaking. Uh, sorry to be interventionist yes. about this. Thank you. Sorry. I, I'm happy to talk afterwards, but thank you. We, we'll take two questions, if that's OK. okay. Um, thanks. What do you think is the realistic uh, possibility that the EU would link somehow its funding and support to these governments with actual implementation? What's the, and what can we do to um, support that idea? I think that's a stretch, probably, to be perfectly honest. Um, but I think there is a, um, a moment now where it might be possible to at least stretch for it. Um, I think the, um, most important thing to do is probably to keep the spotlight on major politicians from large uh, member states and ensure that if there ever are weak moments where they may be pragmatically tempted to opt for the expediency of saying one thing and doing something else, that this is sort of pointed out as loudly as possible to their constituencies at home. So if, for example, one were to argue for the need for a new push for European democracy, um, then perhaps it's quite important to closely scrutinize what kinds of deals might be made with member state governments who do not seem to share the desire for such a push. Um, and similarly, of course, the various candidates for, for top posts. Uh, I think it's really quite important to um, uh, just uh, shine the light of publicity on whether politicians are in fact uh, uh, saying what they uh, mean and, and meaning what they say. Okay. So. Um Regarding the funds that you said they are clearly available, some of those funds, some of that budget comes from fines, often quite substantial, that are levied based on uh, reporting by media. <laughs> have you heard, I assume you have, uh, of the idea of creating a fund of some sort that uses these funds to funnel the money back into the media to, to support the media, media um, community? What do you think about that idea? Thanks. I think there are a lot of things to very quickly unpack there because I think this is a really important idea. It seems to me we're in a situation where you can make a very compelling case that there is a market failure or a risk of market failure that creates a justification for some form of publicly mandated funding to underwrite prof independent professional journalism with arm's length. The question then is where is that money going to come from? Um, personally, I have a lot of uh, patience for economists who argue that any kind of hypothecated taxes 
that are premised on the business success or potentially failure of individual companies or a, a particular sector, and I should add a sector that is under very intense regulatory scrutiny right now and where some companies might face a lot of headwinds in the near future, that mechanism, while perhaps uh, superficially appealing because of its sort of moral economy, is from a sort of public policy point of view, I think, a quite a risky model. I think there is a separate question of whether all the companies involved in those sectors are paying all the taxes that perhaps one would wish them to, to pay, and I know the OECD and others are looking at that, but that seems to me to be a, a more sensible way to approach this to ensure you have sort of general commitment of resources to things you want to do in society and then general taxation to fund them and not individual links. I mean, imagine what would have happened to public education in the United States if that had been funded on a, by a hypothecated tax on railroads or the bell system and then those, those companies were broken up, right? I mean, it's just poor public policy, uh, it seems to me, to do things that way. Um, so I'm not super fond of that idea, uh, but that takes nothing away from the urgency of addressing the problem or addressing the question of whether all companies are making a reasonable contribution through taxation and other means to the societies in which they operate. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rasmus. I'm afraid that we have no more time for questions. Thank you. Thank you again. We're now going to welcome on the stage our next three speakers who will present us with case studies. So I'm going to call first Juliet Nanfuka from uh, Uganda. <laughs> and then Kuda Hove from Zimbabwe. <laughs> and Dragana Zarkovic. Again, in a spirit to reduce introductions as much as possible, I, I will let you guys introduce yourself. Would you like to start and give us your case study? Thank you. Okay, let's get one of the mic. Oh, Great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Juliet Namfuka. I work with the Collaboration and International ICT Policy for East and Southern Africa, otherwise known as CIPESA. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and we work um, to promote effective and inclusive ICT policy, so we do quite a bit of research around the trends that shape um, the online space in sub-Saharan countries. But without further ado, I'll go straight to the case. As mentioned, I'm from Uganda, and we have something called the social media taxes in Uganda. But before I get there, I think we need to step back, a couple of years back. So I'll go to 2011 during the elections when we experienced what was what we've now come to know as an information control. Um, during those elections, an, inst an instruction was given for um, telecommunication service providers to block the transmission of specific words over SMS platforms. Um, during that time, there was also an instruction given to service providers to block um, Facebook and some Twitter posts. At the time, the media didn't have the language to call these or to identify these as disruptions to freedom of expression, disruptions um, to uh, content. Um, but nonetheless, it happened and pretty much went under the radar. There was a bit of noise made, but not enough. Um, fast forward to 2016, and Juliet is standing in the um, voting line alongside everybody in the hot Kampala sun waiting to cast a vote. And suddenly, our phones stop working. Everybody's knocking on their phones. What's going on? What is going on? social media had been disrupted. But not only social media, so had mobile money transactions. Um, again, the instruction had come from the state. Um, and the idea was, or rather the instruction was to protect national security at such a critical time um, in the national, in the country's uh, um, political narrative. Then at this time round, there's a bit more noise made because more people were online. Um, more people felt a whole lot more affected, more people were beginning to speak the language of, digi of digital rights, including the media, because a lot of the media were referring to, or what they were using um, online spaces to share information, to source information, but alas, they could not do that to the same extent that they'd been doing it previously. So there we see a stronger pushback, or rather stronger narrative coming out about social media text, rather about um, online um, content controls, but still not enough. Uh, fast forward to 2018, just last year, when suddenly, um, upon, the, upon a directive by the president to curb uh, gossip, 
but on the other hand, the financial ministry was saying that uh, the social media tax rather was introduced to um, increase the tax base. We saw, yes, of course, the introduction of a social media tax of 200 shillings per day of access to platforms such as WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and various uh, VPN sites. Among others, I keep adding on sites that uh, blocked. Um, but this time, there's a shift in the narrative. There's a whole lot more interest by the media and citizens around the discussion around of um, access to the internet, access to the online spaces, ac access to local content, um, which has sh essentially there's been a shift, a growing interest in what is happening online and the capacity to share and access information online. But this time around, it hit a whole lot harder because there's a financial implication. Suddenly, people's po pockets have been affected. And of course, a whole lot more will make noise. Um, so we have people affected at a personal level, but also media houses, who is consuming their content, how is content being shared if people are not on WhatsApp to carry forward um, content. So there, there was a change in the type of narrative around the taxes. Um, but also there was a shift in the type of content now journalists could access. Many were referring, or some rather, referred to sources via those very social networks. But if the taxes it had led well, essentially, the taxes did lead to a drop in the number of people accessing the internet. We dropped from, we dropped down to 37% um, internet access. That's a loss of 5 million people at the time when the taxes were introduced, which is a massive number. These are people primarily in the urban areas and some in the rural settings. But what the social media taxes also did is push in basic internet connectivity even further away for many, many citizens in the country, primarily, primarily women, youth, and persons with disabilities, all of whom have unique content that the media relies on, the media uses to source information and to back up or validate stories. So there we have an entire audience pushed out, pushed further away from um, the online um, space. But in addition to that, we also have a loss in the, in the production of local content, a loss in the production of content, uh, or rather sharing of content, which is more meaningful to people outside of the traditional or mainstream media space. Even though we may not call it news, it is news for someone outside of that um, mainstream space. So that is something that also took place in Uganda's case. Um, yes, yeah, so each, each time that we've seen a shift in, or rather an, introdu an introduction in some form of regulation of online content, thank you. Thank you. Um, we've seen an increase in media interest, but is it enough? I don't believe it is, because even to date, we do not see enough media coverage of the cases um, that were pre presented against um, the social media shutdowns, the various network disruptions that we've had. It's still not enough. So we still have a gap in the media interest on digital rights, which is why we also see this space or rather disc discussions taking place, the media interest perhaps is not where it should be, even in countries where it is very blatant and with increasing um, regulations coming up almost at a daily basis. There's a whole lot more lined up. And with elections coming up in 2021, now more than, ne more than ever is a time that we need to see a whole lot more media questioning coming out. Um, in anticipation, what is yet to come? Are we going to see more shutdowns? How do we work around it? Are VPNs enough? Or will those be blocked? So that's the kind of narrative that we'd like to see a whole lot more taking place um, in countries such as Uganda where information controls have been present for quite some time and we've been reacting to them about, as opposed to being proactive around them. Um, I think I will put, I think that's, that's well, I'll, I'll stop for now. I'll, I'll add that even when the state had come up and made very large announcements about the financial gains that the state was going to have with the introduction of the taxes, those taxes, or rather those gains, have not been met. Um, instead, we, see more, we saw more people pushed out and not enough local content being distributed um, and a bit of a knock to some of the media houses, which have attempted to recover, but not enough. Um, but still, even then, not enough questioning or probing by the state or rather by the media on where the money collected, even though it is not as much as, it, as had been anticipated, where is the money going to? How is it servicing the communities, the underrepresented, those without access? That's where we'd like to see a whole lot more media interrogation um, in the face of the various affronts that we're seeing in um, the country. Thank you.
Thank you very much. We will have a little time for, for questions after the three speakers have spoken. So, Kuda. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kuda Ove. I'm with the uh, Media Institute of Southern Africa, Zimbabwe chapter. Um, MISA has a presence in, currently we've got a presence in four countries across Southern Africa. Zimbabwe, um, Zambia, Malawi, and Zambia, Malawi, and Tanzania, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I basically lead uh, MISA Zimbabwe's digital work and legal work, uh, digital policy work and legal work. And that's it for introduction. And my talk is briefly looking at how these four countries are now using or using the advancement of technology in their countries as a way to have new life in their agenda to chill and restrict, restrict free, free expression. So before the, the rollout of uh, technology, before the increase that we're seeing across those four African countries in access to the internet, for example, um, these countries were being criticized for maintaining um, laws that are against free expression, laws that are against access to information. And most of the criminal law codes included blatant violations such as criminalizing of defamation, which is normally a civil law issue. So you'd have a criminal law code having something like criminal defamation and uh, criminal insult in the laws. So that was a way to obviously restrict free speech. And as the years rolled by, as we came out uh, into the 2000s, mid 2000s, we saw a drop in those laws from the national statutes because people were taking cases to court, they were challenging them, and countries didn't have any reason to hold on to those laws anymore. But then with the emergence of social media, countries are now getting a fresh breath or a fresh angle to attack free expression. And how does this look in real life? It looks like this. Uh, so in Zimbabwe, every time government wants to do something, there's someone who always leaks information out to a friend, a relative, or something. So for example, we had a new series of banknotes that were coming out. And someone shared images of these banknotes with members of the public. They ended up on Twitter. They ended up everywhere. They ended up on, on WhatsApp. And government came out, the central bank came out, and they said, well, these are lies. We're not even working on this. You know, like, why would we even bother? And <clears throat> it was condemned and dismissed as a social media rumor. Six to nine months later, indeed, a new series of notes came out, and they were very identif identi identical to the ones that were shared a few months ago on social media. So every time something like that happens, government is quick to say that social media abuse. No one has ever bothered to define what social media abuse really is or really entails. And it's government simply using its old tactics to have a broad, vague term that is very intentional in its harms, but it's very hard to understand. So you, at, at every time that you're sending a tweet that involves criticizing government, you're not really sure whether you are breaching this unidentified um, and unwritten law of socially uh, abusing social media. But that's what government is now using. And it's the same with uh, Zambia, it's the same with Malawi. In Zambia, the Minister of Transport and Communication went as far as saying, well, Zambians are abusing social media so much so that they would actually ban Facebook, Google, and Twitter from Zambia. I don't, he never went into how he would ban them, but again, we see them pointing out to this really vague concept of social media abuse. And every time in Zimbabwe that um, that's been said, it's always been a government representative, and it's always different government representatives at different times. So we've got members of the military coming in and saying, Zimbabwe really needs to work on its cybercrime laws because people are abusing social media. Um, we've got, we've got um, the central bank governor, we've got people from the president's office. And in 2017, under the previous regime of the previous government, 
they even went as far as introducing a ministry of cybersecurity and threat uh, identification and mitigation. And when they were asked, what exactly will this new ministry do that isn't already being done by the Minister of ICT, the spokesperson simply said, well, we look to China, Korea, and Russia for our inspiration, and it's something that we really need to do. Because, quote unquote, people are being naughty on social media. So if we're really not careful in um, the participation of the formulation of these online laws or regulation of the online activities, we'll go back to a situation where we find ourselves backling laws that broadly um, restrict free expression and broadly ex uh, restrict access to information. So this trend, um, as we discuss um, online regulation, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Malawi have taught us as an organization to be on the lookout for the resurfacing or restructuring of anti-free expression laws that are now coming back as a way to regulate the social media. I would say that's my talk and brief, and I'm open to engagements during the question time. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Pedro Gama would love to hear from you now. Thank you. So, um, hello everybody. I'm actually coming from media. I'm coming from small independent investigative outlet from Serbia, Balkans. Uh, that's the place close to the European Union, but not still there. So, um, as you will see, that very much affects basically position uh, from which I will be talking um, today. So, just to tell you briefly um, about the BIRN in Serbia, that is the part of the broader network that covers nine uh, countries of the Balkan region, and we do mainly analytical and investigative journalism. So in order to like, give you the context um, in which we are working, I think that's uh, quite important. Like, Serbia is uh, backsliding on um, all the lists that are measuring like corruption, democracy, and media freedoms over the last 10 years um, with the very, like I would sh say, a sharp drop of media freedoms in the last three to four years. Um, and that entails like all the sorts of pressures, including like non-functional media market, um, and also uh, like a capture of all traditional media. And that puts us in very, uh, I would say, situation where we are very dependable and vulnerable to the social networks, basically, that are becoming the main channel for any communication um, with the public. Because except for the uh, internet, there is actually one cable TV station, one daily, and a couple of weeklies with very small circulation that are still not part of government propaganda machinery. So. We are actually working in that um, context and trying to fulfill our public role as somebody who will broke the truth and um, all the corruption that is happening in our country to, to the public. Um, and I will use just the latest example that we had um, and want to stress that there were many of such examples previously as well, but I will use the latest one just to um, picture how complicated the situation can become and why is it so difficult probably to strike this fine balance between uh, basically protecting uh, uh, media freedoms and public interest and on the other hand um, like a privacy, privacy protection. Uh, because a lot of notion when it comes to regulation of social networks coming, is coming from the notion to protect privacy which is totally rightful, like I'm very much for that, uh, but I also think that media should be exempted from that uh, uh, as they are gen in general exempted, not just on digital space, uh, but in, in, in work that we are doing in general. Um, so we actually published a story about the father of the Minister of Interior who over the last couple of years became like very successful businessman, although he was a pensioner before that, uh, a guy who developed a lot of businesses like from um, giving different like uh, services, opening bars, restaurants, and so on, consultancies. But then the latest one was that he started trading weapons, which is state-controlled business. Uh, so this is high-level corruption, very sensitive case, which we published then um, as attempt to control the damage. Uh, 
um, the guy who leaked the information to us was uh, arrested and other people were, were threatened on that case. Um, but also like uh, a best man of interior minister was started giving phone calls to the people that were involved with his father, uh, trying basically to pay them for silence. And these people contacted us. And we got these records and published the article. And with the article, we also published the video. So a day later, we are getting an uh, email from YouTube saying that they will remove the content from the YouTube uh, on the breach of the privacy. But they didn't explain like in what exact like sense the privacy is breached. They said like, it can be because of title, it can be because of a picture, it can be because of a use of a name. So you don't actually know what is the reason. Apart from that, you don't know who actually filed the complaint because that is the information that was not given to us. Um, and they then offered like a couple of tools that we can use. Uh, they said you don't have to remove immediately that material, but you can fix it so you can blur uh, uh, a part of material that you you think is problematic without telling us like why somebody complained about that material. So we send them the letter and say basically we are a legit media operation, this is public interest story, um, people that we are writing about um, are involved in high level corruption and we think that we should not remove but please tell us like what is wrong with it. Maybe we can consider. Nobody responds to that one. Like two days later, that video is um, removed from, from YouTube. So we contacted our colleagues from different organizations that are like uh, um, media development organizations, but also internet freedom organizations, and basically tried to put pressure on YouTube to put that video uh, back. We also called, because uh, that was at the time when GDPR was uh, basically started being implemented in Serbia as well, although Serbia is not part of, of, of the EU yet, but we, anyway, in the process of getting there, started implementing the laws, so GDPR works in Serbia. We also quoted, like, article, uh, I think it's 85 of the GDPR, which in a way um, guarantees media to be exempted from, um, from protection, of some of the uh, uh, cases of protection of privacy. Mm, so after eight days, I think, like, uh, the video was retrieved, like, it was back. But when you're in a media business, you know, eight days later, it's an old story, yeah? So for us, eight days is not enough. So I just use this uh, uh, brief example to illustrate some of the problems that we are facing that are basically, <laughs> I'll try, in a way, to group it. Like, um, first of all, that the system is not telling you what is actually wrong. Who is, who is complaining so that you can respond like uh, uh, to that complaint in gen uh, and not like respond in general. Um, then the issue that basically social networks are, com are more inclined, I would say, to respond to such a claims in order to protect themselves than to go into the situation of communicating with some small media outlet from Serbia uh, who is right in that case, uh, which brings us to another problem, and that is that Serbia like, is a small market. Um, it is small, I would say, language, small market, not big enough so that social networks are having their representatives there. So that communication is very, like, I would say, slow um, and, and inefficient. And it also puts, like, public interest media in situation that we are in a constant fight with our governments because they have all machinery that is backing them. Like they have public servants that are working during work hours as, as their bots and trolls. Like influencing public space, filing complaints about the media, uh, reporting us to social networks in, uh, uh, so that our content is, is banned. So that means that like a couple of us, I lead a team of eight people are fighting like the entire machinery um, that works on a budget. Uh, and that is blocking that is blocking our content. Um, but this case also gives us some ideas, like how can we go forward? And I think it's important to stress, like what helped in this particular case um, was the networking. 
So we had a contact with organizations that are in touch with social networks, that are sitting in forums like this and have developed like communication lines. Uh, so being in touch with them, I think, I, I personally think helped our case uh, that we could get that, that content back. Um, the other thing that I would um, say was um, that our colleagues from Serbia, from Share Foundation, that is foundation that is dealing with digital freedoms, also pointed the issue of um, uh, social networks not having their representatives in the countries um, where they op operate, although that is like against um, the law. And also that is something where we should make, make the pressure. And the third thing is um, that I really think media should have some special status and do not uh, basically be treated as any private or any other um, user of the social networks because of the important role and the public role that we are playing. So recognizing that position of media uh, is very important and we have actually legal backing for that. The Article 85 that I just uh, uh, quoted of the GDPR recognizes that media should be exempted from such a case. So I think that gives us some ground on which we can go further and advocate for probably better position um, because small independent media operations, as I said, are very vulnerable in, in, in that space, um, although they are playing like increasingly important social role, especially in the countries where democracy are under threat so and where social networks are the only places where independent information and political debate is going on thank you very much Dragana. so we have a little time for questions okay <laughs> I would also encourage ladies to raise their hands. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrei Petrovsky from the before mentioned Share Foundation. Uh, I don't have a question. I just wanted to have a brief comment basically to um, continue on what Dragana said. Um, yeah, media definitely have a special place in society and special function, meaning that the necessity for having some sort of a special treatment is, is visible. But in the past few years, I can say now that we have more often and often issues with uh, platforms, with uh, big companies like Facebook, Google, etc. And many organizations and many individuals, even public figures, often approach us with having problems like content taken down or uh, their accounts being um, disabled for some reason. You mentioned the, the reporting. That, that is quite a common practice, not only in Serbia and the Western Balkans, but all around the globe. So my two cents into this discussion here would be, what is the approach in contacting these platforms? Because we as an organization do have some sort of a channel which is sometimes efficient, sometimes it's not. But we need a more systematic and more stable approach to uh, engage them into talking to us and into listening to uh, these types of problems before, because sometimes uh, eight to 10 days for a video for, for a news piece that's highly relevant at the moment is it's more than its lifetime. Uh, in that particular case, and this is my last sentence, uh, what I, because I was really frustrated when that happened and I talked to Tanya, who I don't know, maybe she's here somewhere. Um, uh, my, my, my personal advice was just try to be proactive instead of reactive. Just put it on Vimeo or another platform. Try to fight it uh, with your own means, with, 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 with what you know. Because sometimes getting into communication with an, with an automat, basically, a machine on the other side, can be very, very frustrating and not really effective. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We have uh, the lady there. Um, there. Okay. And then here. And then gentleman here and the lady here. <coughs> So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mariana Gomez. I come from Brazil and I'd like to uh, ask you some questions. Um, to Professor Julia, I'd like to know, in your view, what are the priorities in, a, in creating a policy of digital rights in Uganda and for the other 
two participants. I'd like to ask you, um, how do you understand um, the policies in digital rights in your countries can help uh, population to understand internet in a broad way? Because for example, in my country, 6% of um, Brazilians have some kind of access to internet, but most of us understand uh, internet through uh, some applications uh, like social media, specifically Facebook. So we think internet is Facebook. So I'd like to know uh, what you think. Thank you. Shall we take uh, two more questions and then go back to, to the speakers? Hello everyone, I'm Liz Orembo from the Kenya ICT Action Network and uh, I'd like to, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but I'd still uh, like some reactions from, from the panel. Now, uh, we've been engaging with the, the policy makers on especially digital taxation, which also touches on uh, social media and access to the internet. Now, rightly so, our governments are saying that our our budget is increasing, and also we've uh, borrowed so much money, especially from China, and we need to pay that debt. So that means that we, we have to increase our tax net. Yet the business models, uh, the trends of business models are going to digital. That means that the regulator or uh, the taxman cannot see what people are doing and uh, Therefore, they can't tax uh, these sorts of business that are disappearing online. So in short, if you, are, if you had a shop selling something, you would only need a small space or even your house, and then you just, uh, you just advertise online, and you'll have people uh, ask, uh, asking you for what you're selling. So that means very many businesses going this way, and uh, you, you can understand them because... Um, it means they, they spend very little and they don't have to register. So for the government, it means that the tax net is decreasing and uh, it's going to the platforms because people are advertising on uh, Instagram, on Facebook, and whatever uh, big platforms, platforms that there are. For the government, since they don't have anything or uh, they don't have the visibility and uh, the technical uh, enforce, enforcement capabilities, they are going to increase the tax to the end user. So that means internet is going to be more expensive to, to the end user, yet money is going to these other big companies. So when you ask Facebook, Facebook will tell you that we don't, they don't get much revenue from Africa and uh, they'll be less cooperative. Yet, even if we don't give them much revenue, as they claim so, we give them eyeballs for them to, for them to, uh, for them to advertise their content. So I'd really like a reaction on how we can, we can diplomatically approach this so that companies are more responsible to governments because at the end of the day is the end user, these costs are being transferred to the end user. Thank you. Um, I have a question to Juliet. Um, I'm Lena from DW Academy. Um, so what do you think should, or what was the reaction of media organizations as stakeholders in the debate around the social media tax? So were they part of the advocacy or policy efforts? Or what do you think should, should the strategy be in these situations? So should there will be like uh, just reporting or advocacy or should they be active in, in the debate? So we will answer now, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so I'll respond to the question um, on whether digital, Uganda has a digital rights policy. We do not have a dedicated digital rights policy. We have various policies in place that do affect digital rights. However, we perhaps could and should do a whole lot more in how those policies are either implemented or work on improving them because many of them still have gaps 
um, as some of them were uh, rather outdated. Um, we can look at our access to information policy, for example, which affects the online um, space with regards to open data um, and a bit on uh, data privacy. Um, but specific to access to information, that law is fantastic, but it's a bit outdated in how it, it relates to the current uh, behaviors online with regards to open data. It doesn't make explicit call, for example, um, that data should be presented in a more accessible and user-friendly manner. As long as data is released, that is where it stops. It doesn't call for it to be in Excel format, for example. So we could and should do a whole lot more with regards to the implementation and the improvement of current uh, legislation. Unlike Nigeria, which has a dedicated digital rights bill in motion, um, perhaps that is a model that more countries can use um, uh, with regards to making issues more specific um, to digital rights, <laughs> considering that many of our laws have very many gaps still. Um, with regards to the reaction by the media and what role they should play, I think they should play all those roles. Um, it affects them as an individual for starters, um, but it also affects them as a stakeholder in the greater digital um, rights movement, in the greater internet governance arena. So they should be part of the debate, they should be sharing the debate, the different sides of the debate, but they should also take a whole lot more ownership of their position in um, the whole um, framework, um, more actively, proactively. So as opposed to being asked to come to the table, they should be at the table more intentionally. And that's something that we need to work a whole lot more on, um, the ownership of uh, that space held by the media. Often we've seen we have to call them, or call media, not so much to have a place on the stage, but as a member of the audience, and that is something that is greatly internalized. So we need to have more efforts towards shifting that mindset from simply being in the room to actively uh, participating in and owning the discussions that take place. And then there was a question on the tax. Um, Every country taxes for one reason or another. Um, in some countries, we simply do not see where current taxes are going. So when more taxes are collected, more questions emerge. And I think that is where the confusion comes. Um, people need to see that the taxes being paid are going somewhere meaningful or more relevant to them. But if you're in a country with a broken health system, broken public transport, and you're calling for more taxes, you have not really um, made your case to demand more taxes, and all you're doing is creating a whole lot more uncertainty about where the taxes are going. So right now, um, the current narrative is, uh, no, it was just taxes being collected for the upcoming elections. Is it? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, but that's what we're doing. We're not really addressing the problems, but instead creating more um, clouds of uncertainty with increased demands for taxation. Taxation isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, however, it just needs a whole lot more transparency, and that is something where we see a very big gap in many developing countries, which is why we see the perpetual um, uh, negative um, perceptions of uh, taxation, and even more so when it comes to the digital arena, because that becomes a whole lot more invisible as opposed to collecting money to build a road, to build a school. Um, so there's that tension that we are currently trying to navigate, and it should be interesting to see where that goes in coming years. Um, I think that was it, yeah? Kuda? Oh, okay. um, so I'll, I'll tackle the, the questions from the participant from Brazil. Um, so like very much like Uganda, we don't really have dedicated digital policies, but we've got laws that, if anything, restrict rather than promote use of the internet and access to information online and free expression online. And how do we get people involved? So in Zimbabwe, um, I would say Brazil is a bit different. It's the inverse of what's happening in Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, when you come into a room and you say, how many people are on the internet, hands don't go up. Um, how many people use the, in the email, hands go up. How many people use WhatsApp, more hands go up. Well, how many people use Facebook, more hands go up. And so people in Zimbabwe understand the internet as the broader open internet, your, your 
email, your other applications, your websites, but they don't understand that social media is actually part of the internet. They think it probably works the same way as SMS because it's all short instant messages. So it was only after January 2019, uh, after we've, we'd experienced almost a week long internet shutdown, that people actually understood that when we talk about the internet, we're also talking about these social media um, uh, platforms. So in our work, we now try to stay away from the bigger terms about digital policy, internet governance, and we start where people are and we say, for you to be able to talk to your relative outside of Zimbabwe on WhatsApp, you need the internet. So when we then talk about um, data access, uh, affordability, for example, the affordability of the internet, availability of the internet, we're talking about something that they can relate to. And then we bring in the terms once people have established that they need the internet for those basic services. So I would say that the use of services in our work and in explaining why our work is important and relevant has actually made more progress than, bring, than starting the conversation from a policy perspective and then trying to relate people to that. Um, well, to pick up on the same question, I guess that was the question for all of us. Um, like we also have a set of different laws that are tackling digital arena as well. Our government also has their digital agenda. Like they are very much into like uh, digital in different different ways. So I wouldn't say that access to internet um, is huge problem in in Serbia. I think like misuse of all the opportunities that are offered by internet uh, is. Is, is definitely the biggest problem. Because the moment citizens realized what internet serves for, like the government and political parties picked up and basically the entire political life is now uh, happening on, on social networks with all the good and bad implications uh, of that. But what people definitely are not aware of is like what is their input into that game of social networks and using internet. Like how much of their personal information and data goes into that? How these algorithms are working? Uh, how their feeds are created? How uh, information is presented and selected to them? And I think that's one of the crucial um, issues, especially if you speak from position from which I'm, I'm speaking, like of uh, a media operation that is fighting for uh, hearts and minds of the people in that arena. That that's not always um, that's not always easy. So I would always like ask for a greater transparency when we speak about the algorithms and the things like how uh, some some content is selected based on what criteria, uh, what are the information that are collected, not just for monetization uh, that also our social networks are using personal data, but also to create like and select the information to, to, to basically um, curate the content uh, that, that will come to the end users. Thank you very much. I need to apologize. <laughs> I need to apologize. I know we have more questions, but I would, I would ask you to please keep them from the end because we really need to, to move on with our session. Thank you everybody again for, for speaking to us. It was really enlightening. So we're now going uh, to um, an interactive section of this session, thanks to our shepherd through, <laughs> through this part of our event, who is uh, Daniel O'Malley. He is the deputy editor of SEMA. Thank you, Daniel. Great. Thank you, Elena. Um, hello, everyone. Um, we're now going to move to a section that's going to be much more interactive. It's great to see all of you here, and we want to make sure that we capture some of the ideas and things that you're working on for uh, the work that we as a community do going forward. So first of all, I want to get a sense of, do, do people know what the, uh, the Dynamic Coalition on the Sustainability of News and Journalism, News Media and Journalism is? OK, so there are some people out in the audience who don't know. This is actually a really important thing for our community, but this year, um, uh, a group of us have succeeded in getting the IGF to uh, create a dynamic coalition that allows the media development community to have a space in the agenda at the IGF. And so this is an opportunity that we 
uh, can take to really make sure that the other stakeholders, especially the social media companies, governments, are paying attention to the overall news media ecosystem. But to make this happen, we as a community need to be engaged on both advocacy and research. We need to come to these meetings prepared to engage. So what we want to do now is we're going to break out into two different groups. One group is going to be discussing um, the kind of research agenda that we need going forward and that what kind of projects that we would want to work on over the next year to bring to IGF next year. And the other group, which my uh, colleague Courtney Ratch, who's the advocacy director at the Committee to Protect Journalists, is going to lead, is on advocacy. How do we uh, leverage this position within the, the IGF system in order to make, uh, uh, make our engagements with other stakeholders more effective? So I'm going to ask us to, um, we're just going to informally break up at whichever group that is most interesting or most um, compelling to you right now. We've had some really great presentations earlier by Rasmus about uh, digital media sustainability, financial sustainability. We had some great presentations about um, the social media component. So I think we have a lot of issues to talk about. We're going to break up and we're going to have, unfortunately because of the time, we're only going to have about you know, 20 minutes to discuss. Then we'll come back. Uh, and, and wrap things up. So I'm going to be leading the discussion on research over in this corner of the room, and Courtney is going to be leading the discussion on advocacy over in this corner of the room. Okay, go. Yeah. 